Yeah, globalization is over. Here on Global Connections, Think Tech Hawaii, it's a, a given Monday, the 3 o'clock block. And we have Rupmati Kandakar. She joins us from New York City. Uh, and she is writing a book about this very subject. Uh, hi, Rupmati. Hello, Haji, and a pleasure to be on Think Tech Hawaii, uh, as always. And uh, it's, it's, it's a topic which we have come to after mentioning globalization in such so many of our previous programs. So uh, let's go. <laughs> okay, well, you know, it just, we, we, we have to tackle this because it's a big subject. And I guess what, um, you know, what raised it for me was a, a, an article by David Brooks, columnist in the New York Times, where he said, you know, um, globalization is, is over. And then I, I looked that up, you know, I found it, oh my goodness, this has been a subject of discussion for some time. And uh, they call it de-globalization, they call it reverse globalization. Uh, and it has to do with, um, you know, isolationism and siloism, if you will, in various countries around the world, um, often, if not usually autocratic countries, uh, democratic countries, uh, you know, would like to see globalism, but uh, autocratic countries are not so interested. Um, and I want to, I want to, you know, examine a couple of points with you. Number one is, what are the indications of this? I mean, how can I tell that that globalism is reversing? And the second part, which we can get to, you know, a little way down the show, is um, what's going to happen here? How, what effect does this uh, reverse globalization have? So I guess the first thing is, how do we know? What are the indicators that tell us that globalization, which we used to think was a great idea, is actually not happening? So Jay, we came into globalization after uh, in the 1990s when we had liberal uh, globalization. That is, you say, the idea of uh, economics, which came into being. You know, you could say that economics was going to drive the uh, international system. So we have something which is coming up in the uh, global order, which is saying, let's work on our common goods. Let's come together on common grounds. So we have uh, issues like, uh, let's have trade liberalization. We have, uh, let's discuss tariffs and uh, exports imports in such a way that it is symbiotic or mutual benefits for both the countries, uh, multilateral countries. You have this system where you can see the uh, global players coming into agreements with each other. Let's have the NAFTA, let's have uh, the uh, ASEAN, let's have these free trade zones where we don't have tariffs. There is free trade of, uh, uh, there's free movement of goods, of people and of ideas. So this entire uh, uh, tenet of uh, globalization is where there is free movement and the crux, the crux of this was the political norm of democracy. So you have a political norm which is floated saying that make your uh, institutions democratic, but we have China also joining in with their unique system. So you have something of an accommodating system where you are bringing in everybody, come on, irrespective of the differences, let's come together for common goods. Then you have the idea of, uh, we have a monetary fund, let's have money floating in. So money is the common factor, right? Uh, which will give loans, which will give you restructuring, which will help you come in and uh, uh, take in the, uh, what is that? Take in the, uh, you have drawbacks, you have uh, shortfalls in adjusting to globalization, these monetary uh, institutions will help you. Then you have climate, which is a common factor which binds together people. So you have these things. You have immigration, which are crossing boundaries. These tenants don't have boundaries. So globalization is speaking. We are all traveling. We are all uh, staying in each other's countries. Fine. But when some when does it implode? We have the real implosion when we have these pandemic, uh, this pandemic which struck and you have countries which uh, close the national borders, correct? Then the uh, reliance on the others was just on essential imports and exports and only on um, your uh, supplies for uh, COVID. So suddenly you had countries going back to uh, you know, uh, tightening, uh, restricting uh, movement. 
that is when before this when conflicts used to happen they used to be regional they used to be targeted we didn't have a global impact the pandemic brought about a global impact and then you have the russia ukraine crisis where you have sanctions put in on one of the biggest players in the economic market we we have to take a neutral stand on this in the sense that russia is one of the largest suppliers of europe so uh, uh, and uh, we have america which is monitoring which is the uh, uh, hegemon of the liberal economic order and we to sanction and to try to isolate this is bringing a wave of turmoil which is not seen yet and that is when we can say that globalization is really imploding right now because what what he has done what mr putin has done is he has bought in the ruble system instead of the petrodollar now that has really shaken up the foundation of the global economic liberal financial system which was um, whole soul dependent on the dollar so when a, a, a idea which is floated on economics and economics rocks so you have to have something which is now uh, people are talking about it's the end the beginning of the end so that's what globalization is on a decline and very fast that's yes. a happy thought <laughs> <laughs> well i remember when um, you know I, I was traveling in europe this is uh, maybe 20 even 30 years ago and I was traveling from France to Germany. <clears throat> and uh, there's a river, uh, I want to say it's the, the Rhine River, possibly, but there's a river there. And you cross the river into Germany. And it was we were driving. And it was remarkable that there was no sign of the boundary at all. Yeah. The, the border was completely invisible. There was no guardhouse. There was not even a mark on the road. Um, there was there was no indicator whatever, and the only thing is the next town you got to, they spoke German. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> yeah. And I said to myself, this is you know this is a new kind of enlightenment that you can get around Europe without even knowing where the borders are. This is a marvelous thing. Um, it only bespeaks of. And then you know a few years later, Thomas Friedman wrote his first flat world uh, article That's for it. the New York Times. And um, that was really important because he, he, as usual, he recognized a, um, you know, a, a development that we hadn't noticed, a sea change. And uh, that was also very enlightening. And you thought, gee whiz, um, you know, with all these trade agreements that you spoke of, um, with all the travel restrictions being lifted, all that heavy, you know, bureaucracy on passports and visas, you know, gradually being, being lifted. Um, and of course, technology helps to communicate across the borders and to translate an automatic translation, automated translation. The world was becoming one. And of course, there were, you know, points of resistance here and there, um, points of, you know, disagreement and violence and, and wars, even genocides were happening. But in general, it seemed to be coming together, with the exception of a few areas that that were focused on negative things and destructive yes. things. <clears throat> but uh, what's happened, and let me ask you, what's happened in the last couple of years, it hasn't been that long, um, Tom Friedman has to change his mind and, and David Brooks changes his mind too. Um, you know, the enlightenment seems to be over. And, and the, first, the first thing that happens that suggests that we have to reinstate national boundaries, that we have to reinstate travel, we have to be careful, even paranoid, is COVID. Co COVID dropped the curtain around every country, and to some extent still is. So what effect do you think that, you know, the COVID pandemic had on this process, this, this trend we were seeing um, on um, the flat world on globalization. CJ, the oneness of the global system was uh, 
was just, you know, you had these small little ripples when you had make in America, make in China, make in India. Nobody said, stay inside your boundaries. It was always make here and try to prosper outside. But uh, this which struck was uh, giving something people to, uh, it, it forced people to stay inside their boundaries. You couldn't give outside. So you have to look within your uh, boundaries. And that is when the entire uh, concept of borderless, limitless, uh, transparent uh, uh, interactions comes to a, a standstill. So uh, now to work across this um, implosion is going to be something of uh, a task because you have to have these bilateral, multilateral agreements you have to keep them going because we cannot undo the work of four or five decades in a minute because globalization was bringing prosperity to all. The democratic norm of, uh, sorry, the no political norm of democracy was bringing peace uh, more than it was because two democracies never go to, rarely go to war together. That is a, uh, that is a proven tenet. That's very so, interesting. Uh, That's a very interesting notion. Yes. Yeah. So, so you have these thriving uh, concepts. Why should we let them go at the blink of an eye? It's a, it's a phase. We have to pass through this phase and we have to bring um, the entire international system to such a point that we come back to the oneness because this oneness helped us in the exact COVID pandemic when supplies were being uh, transferred from uh, the have-nots to the haves, uh, sorry, the haves to the have-nots. So you have this, uh, uh, COVAX system where uh, economies, uh, um, countries from people who have vaccines going to no vaccines. You have this give and take, you have this balancing act going on. Can you let it go just on the basis of um, two wars, two, uh, you know, a pandemic? No, these two points cannot make you have, say that it's the end of the pandemic. Yeah. So we have to look forward on this, isn't it? Well, then, you know, the other thing is I mentioned in my remarks a minute ago that there were, even as globalization was arising, um, there were certain parts of the world that, that where it wasn't happening, which were focused on violence and terrorism and so forth. And one of those places, um, of course, is the Middle East, which has a, a pension for <laughs> for. for violence and all that you know it's not like you want to get up and and take a trip to the middle east you know back in the a hundred years ago people would go to the middle east regularly it was a, i mean in some of these countries that are now impossible uh they would go and they and they would you know have a nice tourist experience but all that has ended you wouldn't go to syria in a million years now um, and so what's what's happened while we were uh enjoying if you will um the globalism in, say, the Western countries and, and the larger country, India certainly was enjoying globalism. Um, and to some extent, you know, Africa and uh, Latin America, um, not to a lesser extent, I would say. Um, uh, in the Middle East, it was, it was uh, decompensating. It was, you know, it was getting more and more violent. And then now you look and you realize that Mr. Putin was involved in destroying Aleppo. And the same general that he's bringing in for the Donbass in Ukraine is the general who destroyed Aleppo. How, how, his, how interesting a coincidence is that? And so what you find is that the, the areas that have gone, that have resisted globalism, have created violence and, you know, uh, I don't know what you say, anti-globalism, um, are, are the areas um, like that, like the Middle East. And Mr. Putin is involved in both places. We weren't really watching. We weren't yeah. watching that general. We weren't watching what was going on in Aleppo. Um, um, D D Donald Trump wasn't watching for sure. He was completely um, naive about it. And, and so now we find looking back that, that actually this process um, that uh, David Brooks writes about, this anti-globalism, reverse globalism, actually has been happening in some areas of the world for, for a while. Uh, we just weren't watching. We weren't watching who was responsible. And we weren't putting, we weren't connecting the dots. 
it seems to me your point a minute ago is really, really important that democratic countries don't generally go to war with each other. Yeah. It's the autocrats who are seeking territory and power um, and, I don't know, genocide, whatever it might be. Um, they're the ones who are going backward. They're the ones who don't want globalism. Is that right? Yeah, they're, they're the areas of perpetual conflict. Why? Because it, it is in the interest of these, this uh, Mr. Putin to keep them in perpetual conflict. It gave him a hold over there and gave him a hidden hold. We did not know he is uh, um, he's supporting Syria so wholeheartedly for over 10 years. We did not know this, that he is uh, involved in Middle Eastern politics so deeply. Now, when Saudi Arabia refuses to speak to Biden, pick up the phone calls, there is a certain backing with which they have this confidence. Yeah. So you have this kind of a system where you have a hidden player and you have a outspoken uh, uh, player, but both are superpowers. Two superpowers are driving this globalization and two extremely different uh, uh, ideological backgrounds of both. And both work in interests of each other. Now you have, we are at such a phase in uh, international politics where they're not blinking. So nobody, you know, we have, we have a play, we have a point where we can go blind. So and both have, uh, you know, Russia has six thousand six hundred uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, America has five thousand six hundred nuclear weapons. The world can go uh, kaput a, a couple of times. You know, we don't know. We have to be careful about what they decide, what they do. They, the confrontation cannot go beyond the point. It can just be to a point of saying, hey, do this, but you can't go and uh, you can't provoke the other person in such a way that it exists existential, uh, you know, they have reactions to that. So it has, it is such a delicate game that uh, America has to play right now. It's such a delicate game because we have, we have, like you rightly pointed out, hidden elements which are against the a very, a tenet of democracy or very tenet of globalization. So these hidden termites are going to keep on troubling us till we have, it's going to be now, uh, uh, what do you say? You have to have a more alert game in this. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's, um, that's problematic. I, I, don't, I think, you know, again, as, as in the case of the Middle East, people don't realize it. And I don't think they realize what you're talking about right now. Um, the, the the silo that um, that uh, Putin has has painted around himself is very dangerous because first of all he gives up any notion of of um, uh, altruism of enlightenment of trying to make the world a better place that's the last thing on his mind he's he's only interested in power and by the way Trump was the same way uh, only interested in power. Um, and not not really interested in helping people, making the world a better place, you know, making humanity a, a happier lot. So <clears throat> that's really problematic because he does have the weapons um, and he has the ability through his propaganda to control the public population in his country. So <clears throat> what we have is they're, they're all, I shouldn't say all, but most of them are behind him right now so far. Um, and you're right, he's not blinking. In fact, in fact, the United States is blinking. Western Europe is blinking. <laughs> you know, when it comes to, uh, let, me, let me throw a possibility at you and see what you think. If you pose, if you, uh, if you pose a, a Western democracy, Western style democracy, because as you and I have discussed, not all democracies are the same. They don't always reach the same conclusions, but there are okay. certain fundamental, you know, common denominators. So in the, in the case of a Western democracy, trying to do the blink game, okay, and then Putin, who is uh, slightly psychopathic, um, he doesn't do the blink game. Um, it seems to me that when you pose them together in a, a kind of contention, um, a deterrence process, if you will, who blinks process, if you will, um, Putin will win that. Yes. Often pathological people win this kind of game 
and democracies have trouble making their minds up. They're democracies. They're tumultuous. <laughs> they don't necessarily agree on things. <clears throat> and so uh, I really think that Putin has the advantage, and he also has the ability to deconstruct globalism virtually, as you said, virtually overnight. Yes. See, Jay, they have the, uh, even Trump, he had the jingoism of nationalism behind him. So you have people who will go all out for him. They will think they're doing for the country. So when they talk, they talk of country, Russia, America, make in America, you know, they, they, play, they raise the sentiments. And um, you can't deny the fact that Putin has been the czar of Russia for as long as uh, uh, Biden has been in the, uh, in the Congress. So his experience at international relations is far ahead of Biden. He has more friends for longer time than Biden. Biden has to understand his limitations and then work towards this. I mean, well, you uh, have a friend. You have a friend who is with you for uh, uh, two, three decades, and somebody will come into your group and say, uh, "Let's beat up this guy." You will not. There are some. There is some affiliation. There is some uh, camaraderie that happens, which this allows you to do that. Putin has been working on his relation of building Russia up uh, for so many years. So he has that outlook. He has that, he has a personality with which he has built his own personal uh, rapport with all these um, uh, international players. Biden has to work on it. He, he has to be smarter on his approach. And um, playing with Ukraine uh, in such a way uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, will wait till the war is over. No, we have to understand that we are we are we are facing an equal um, equal enemy. You know, we can't say that antagonistic uh, um, front. Not an adversary. So, huh? So that that we have to we have to be a little bit careful in how we deal with it. It can't be one hammer and out of uh, Libya, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, sorry. Saddam, where we can just change and come out, or we can have a, a absolute change. It's it's a person who's been on the throne for a long time. His experience at international relations is undoubtedly more than Biden's is. Yeah, and and he's been courting countries yeah. in Africa, courting um, Latin America, um, yeah. courting China on an on and off basis, and and courting India. Um, yes. and, they, and they feel a certain obligation to him. They want more of that. They want to be courted. And so he has a certain leverage. And as you say, he's been working on that for a long time, for decades and decades. The United States is not as sophisticated in terms no, of its United foreign States policy. Is, United States is. Biden, personally, he doesn't have the uh, personality to take on Putin in the international uh, arena. Mm. He's using the same words. He's using the same. His approach has to be absolutely different. Oh, you you target him in another way. You can't go sanction, 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 and uh, say that because he is he is a he's a spy. He's a spy who's turned into president. He's going to be better at the game than we are. So we have to be more. Uh, uh, um, the approach has to be absolutely different. He is not some uh, uh, monarch who's just uh, by birth. He's come. He's worked his way up the ranks. He's gone up to the point of being czar of Russia. So we have to understand he is smarter here, and yeah. his support comes from these economies, these uh, which depend on him. Now you see one thing: Europe. It's the Western world. It's the first world. Everything they are still dependent on Putin. And what about when winter comes? Can they say sanctions on Russia? No, there will be a difficulty in saying sanctions on Russia when your house is heated up because of Russian oil and gas. So you have to understand that uh, these people um, have um, a personal approach to international relations in this game because the oil and fuel which comes to the house comes from Russia. Germany will never leave dependent because heavy industries of Germany depend on Russia. How can you close down an industrial uh, uh, country of well, Europe? I wanted to ask you about that. You know, so, so Putin creates the problem 
And yes. um, the U.S. Uh, reacts by saying, well, we need sanctions. And the Ooh. sanctions are economic sanctions. They don't work immediately. They may not work in the long run either because Biden, um, Biden doesn't realize that Putin has ways around the sanctions, you know, and he's doing that. But, but the bottom line, though, is that the, the, the sanctions on Russia, closing down the border with Russia, um, not trading with Russia, um, and, and the oil and gas is really important to the global economy, is damaging the global economy right now. And the notion in Western Europe, you know, that we, we are not only going to um, isolate them now, but it's, it's going on for a while. I mean, it's, this is something we're going to do for a while, and yes. um, they, they're, we're going to isolate them and punish them for a long time because look at all the, look at all the, you know, the, uh, the damage they've done. But what I'm, what I'm getting at, though, is I, I think the damage here, which was created by Putin for sure, and yes. is being perpetuated by Putin, is going to last for a while. It is a, a, a significant element in the reverse globalization process, don't you think? See, Jay, that is absolutely, absolutely point on. Now you see, uh, uh, there was uh, a couple of days back when Elon, Elon Musk uses the star, uh, star uh, group of satellites to bring in Ukraine maps, you have the uh, prime, uh, deputy prime minister of Russia. The Russian prime minister saying, I'm going to blast you in, play, uh, in space. So space, which was a common entity in globalization, where you had such cooperation between Russia and America, now becomes a ground where, uh, of thrashing. So now you have something which is uh, uh, one more common ground being eaten up. Now, what about climate change? You know, you have these bombs being uh, um, operated everywhere. You know, the environment is gone for a toss. Fossil fuels are still going to be burned. So when common grounds are being eroded, globalization is also uh, on the decline. And it is, uh, we are and not, as there's a peak, this is the trough of uh, globalization. And we have to see uh, countries through it. So um, seeing Putin through this phase is what is in the best interest of the international system at this point. Of well, let me, let me ask you the hardest question in town. Are you re yes. ready for a hard question? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what can be done to reverse the process that Putin has accelerated? What can be done to return to globalization? I mean, he's, he's a really angry, pathological person, but he's making everybody else angry too. Yes. And the curtains are coming down everywhere. How do you reverse that? Especially given the fact that he's not going to change his style. Yes. See, this is a repeated story in Ukraine we have from Georgia. When he sees somebody entering uh, uh, NATO, the Warsaw in him gets angry. So uh, you have uh, Mariupol falling and you have him uh, gloating, correct? Now we have to save lives in Ukraine. He has to, somebody has to say, okay. You know, I mean, uh, Zelensky has to open the map and say, now I have to stop. I will say maybe for the timing, I will not join uh, NATO. Just stop this bombardment, bring it to a standstill and then proceed from then on. You know, you have to give space time to rejuvenate in war zones. Even uh, the ancient wars had a uh, closing down at sunset. But this, these people don't relent. They are going on 24 hours for two months almost. Uh, the bombing is going on. Has there been any um, respite for anybody? Just lives are being uh, Well, but away. there's one aggressor and the rest of them are on yeah. the defensive. I mean, would, yes. you, would you agree with me that there, there will, this war will widen? Um, because he, he is doubling down every day um, and he's taking all these steps to be sure that he can claim he won this war before their national holiday on May 9th in Russia. I mean, he's yeah. not about to back off. Um, and is that the way you deal with a pathological leader? Um, do, you, do you give him a break? Do you tell him, okay, you won? Uh, yes. Or do you fight with him and, and beat him? 
Um, this is a real big human nature question here. Jay, on the seventh day, they were in Kiev. They could have taken uh, the presidential palace and changed the government and it would have been over. But he wants it to stretch to a point where the ruble comes up, where Russia comes up, where there is a, um, there is a reinforcement of his uh, position. So this war is being stretched by him and he will stretch it to such a point that he will conquer because they don't have it when, when you're a soldier, you don't give up. You don't give up in your mind, whether you're on the losing side, whether you're on the winning side, you will never give up. And uh, as a statesman, I think even uh, 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 Biden would not give up. So we have to uh, uh, see that it's a long drawn effort that is going to take uh, place this time. And alliances are going to be formed. Hidden alliances are going to be formed. Countries are going to continue supporting Russia. Uh, on the you know on the front, they will come and say, "Hey, we don't like this," but the oil will be still be taken. The petrol will still um, be bought. You know, uh, ruble. You know, Vatican deposited uh, money on the uh, second day, one day before April first. He said, but "You see how damaging ruble. that is. That's very damaging. That you." Yeah that you give up globalism, that you yeah. give up the rule of law, that you that you give up the uh, liberal order of society, of the world, um, just, to, just to satisfy uh, a monster. Uh, what you're saying, the messaging is so clear. You're saying, okay, you win. It's all right that you did yeah. genocide. It's all right that you, did, you invaded and did atrocities. We're gonna give you a pass. And furthermore, we're gonna withdraw the sanctions. So the messaging is really scary because you know that he and others will do it again. And it's so we have- It's a bully mentality. It's a bully mentality that they have and they need it to, to please their ego. You know that? Uh, they have a, a mentality where, hey, you cannot do what I, I say you can't do. So unless you listen to that, and it's such a big country, it's a superpower. We cannot call it a rogue state and get away with it. You know globalization itself made Russia such an integral part of the economic system. Putting it out is bringing the adverse effects which we would not have wanted. A small state being out of the system and a superpower being out of the system, there's a difference in the uh, adversity of effects. Yeah. So, uh, so economic sanctions can continue. Uh, they should continue because to teach a lesson, but how far will they learn is the uh, is the value of the lesson. If they're not willing to sit in the class, how can we give the lesson? They have gone to the, they have gone to the ruble. He, so what about, about to, to, to deal with my, my hard question, okay? Huh? What do we do to stop him? You know, the natural answer, uh, if you think back, the natural answer is the United Nations. It's not just the no. criminal court of justice no. Um, although that hasn't been very effective, and it's not the uh, it's not the soldiers with the blue helmets because they yes. haven't been effective. Um, yes. It's the United Nations, and and if if you say I'm just being Aristotelian about this, if you say okay, here's somebody breaking all the rules, and here's the organization that's supposed to enforce the rules, and they are not enforcing the rules for whatever reason, they are not doing what it takes to push back. You have a failed organization, um, and and I have to say that I think who said? Oh yeah, it was Zelensky said it that the United Nations is a failed organization. <laughs> he said so, dissolved. Theoretically, dissolved. though, theoretically, yeah. the United Nations should be able to say to Putin, "No, you know, you're you're um, you're a naughty child, and you have yes. to stop that right now." Yes. <laughs> but they can't say no. <laughs> My first book was about the reform of the United Nations, in which I said, I spoke about the veto power being used. And so you have the naughty child having the veto power. So uh, everybody will say no, 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 no. And in the end, he will say yes, he has got the veto power. So the entire United Nations is at his mercy too. So uh, a single power, and he's got two of them there with China. So the <laughs> United Nations is ineffective in this conflict as is in 
you know, when you have this veto power at the helm of the uh, United Nations, it doesn't work. No. So reforming the United Nations is is still on after so many years. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. It it could it should be reformed, yes. but could it yes. be reformed? Um, and some people say the United Nations, as the League of Nations, was a, a you know a child of a war. Um, you have to have a war, and you have to see people, millions of people die, and then you say, gee, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, we probably don't want to do that again, so let's make a deal. And so you get the United Nations. Uh, so my question to you, and this is my last question because we're out of time, oh. is, is all this considered, everything we've talked about today, Rupmani, Okay. Is war inevitable? Yes, war is inevitable in uh, international relations because war is a, a expression of your power. It's an expression of your uh, your presence in the international system. So even if a small conflict, even if it's an armed uh, a rebellion, even if it's a, a, a nuclear attack, it's going to be inevitable in the international relations to stamp authority on the international system, to show who's the boss. And uh, I'm still relevant is also one of the crux of uh, or the reasons that uh, countries are going to war. And now war has become, you know, uh, China is waiting to strike uh, Taiwan if it was given in a little bit of a free hand. You know, you have these uh, military exercises which, is, which are happening and confrontational military exercises taking place within the conflict zone. So you have this confrontational attitude right now in international relations, which is uh, volatility in uh, the international system has increased to such a point that we are on the verge of seeing an attack anywhere, anytime, any, any, any moment. It's like that. It's about as far... the domestic problems of each and every country. That's about as far away from the um, globalism as you can possibly get. <laughs> what is reality or realism, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, everybody. I feel a lot better about everything now. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thank you very much for discussing this with me. Um, so and I, I will. I want to check back with you on the progress in your book, uh, and and okay. and see and see how you wrap your thinking around the events that will now follow every day. So, yes. yes. Thank thank you for participating you so in much. this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. Always, Aloha. always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Rupati. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.